Thank you for joining the webinar again. Uh, my name is Kelly Pimentel, and I'm a product manager here at ACD. My colleague Anushka Dixit, an application scientist, will be co-hosting with me. In today's webinar, we'll be focusing on the applications of flight variants, short targets, and point mutations with ACD's base scope assay. Before we begin, um, uh, I'd also like to repeat some housekeeping rules. Um, the audience will be muted for the duration of the webinar. If you have a question, please use the chat function to the right of the WebEx window. Please address your question to all panelists. My colleagues will address your questions in real time. Um, in an event, we have not addressed your questions. We'll follow up with you offline after the webinar. In addition, um, if you could stay um, after the webinar for a few more minutes, uh, we'll try to address some of your questions live. In the agenda for today, I'll first introduce you to our product portfolio for the use of a wide range of applications. Then we'll focus on the base scope assay that enables the detection of slight variants, short targets, and permutations. After that, my colleague Anishka will present on the common applications that necessitate the use of the base scope assay, along with some widely adopted publication data. Um, at the end, we'll summarize our presentation and address some frequently asked questions and live questions as well. To begin, ACD's core technology is the RNAScope technology. RNAScope is an ideal spatial analysis solution to interrogate complex tissue. It is a highly specific and sensitive method to detect RNA biomarkers in cells and tissue with morphological context and single cell resolution. The RNA scope technology consists of three parts. A unique target probe that ACD designs against a sequence of interest, a signal amplification system that generates a high signal to noise ratio, and lastly, visualization of single RNA molecules as dots for qualitative or quantitative analysis. The assay allows for spatial mapping of mRNAs, long non coding RNAs, slice variants highly homologous sequences and permutations in cells and in tech tissues, all which can be visualized with either a fluorescent or chromogenic labels. In addition, the assay can be performed on a wide variety of sample types, including FFPE tissues, fresh frozen or fixed frozen tissues, and culture cells. The first key feature of the RNA scope technology is the probe design. We depict the oligonucleotide target specific probes as these to emphasize the fact that they have two regions linked by a spacer. Each one of these oligonucleotide sequences has been designed using an informatics algorithm that selects its sequences to specifically bind physically to the target sequence and not cross hybridize with any other sequences. The bottom of the Z um, complements and hybridizes to the target transcript. An amplification to occur, the two Zs must hybridize to the target sequence right next to each other. The top of the Z is the base for the amplification structure. When two Zs hybridize, it creates the binding site upon which a preamp can bind and the amplification tree can be built. A standard RNA scope for a target sequence of 1,000 bases or more would consist of 20 ZZ pairs pulled together that are designed to hybridize next to each other. However, I would like to add that RNA scope pairs could vary depending on the sequence of interest. This allows for a tremendous amount of amplification and signal potential. However, um, however only a few Z double Z pairs are needed to bind to the target RNA sequence in order to generate enough signal for molecular detection. The top and bottom of the Zs are linked by a linker. After the target probes are hybridized to the target sequence, three amplifiers are added to the top of the Zs, where multiple amplifiers can then bind to. Each amplifier can then further bind multiple label probes. Sequentially, hybridizing to assemble a branching um, complex at each ZZ binding site. Label probes can contain a chromogenic enzyme such as horseradish peroxidase or HRP. 
that generates a visible signal after comedogenic reaction, such as with DAV or fast red, as detectable under a standard bright field microscope. The label probe can also contain fluorophores that allow for visualization of the signal under a fluorescent microscope. This signal amplification strategy allows for visualization of target RNAs as a single dot, where each dot represents an individual RNA molecule. The entire amplification system allows for high sensitivity. On the other hand, the amplification system is designed to only bind to the double Zs and would not bind to a single Z to enable high specificity of the assay. This slide summarizes all the assays that are currently available from ACD. We have comogenic singleplex brown or red assays and duplex assays on both the manual and automated platforms. The multiplex fluorescent assays allow for detection of up to four targets simultaneously in a single tissue section. The major difference between the two fluor fluorescent assays is that the V2 fluorescent assay is also available on the Leica automated platform. For fireplexing, we have the highplex assay, which enables the detection of up to 12 targets simultaneously in a single tissue section. Currently, the HyPlex assay is available in the manual platform only. If your target of interest is shorter than 300 nucleotides and studying slight variants, short targets or point mutations, then the base scope assays would be the right choice for you. Currently, the base scope singleplex assay is available on all platforms, while the duplex assay is available on the manual platform. As of today, we have over 26,000 target probes in our catalog. Custom probes can be designed against any target from any species in as little as two weeks. Next, expanding our product portfolio, not only do we have assays to detect mRNA, long non-coding RNAs, short targets, splice variants, and point mutations, we'll be releasing a new assay in the summer to detect smaller RNAs, including antisense oligos, microRNAs and small interfering RNAs. Next, we'll focus specifically on the base scope assay. Before we get into the details of how the base scope assay works, let's first talk about why is it important to detect unique and short RNA targets. Detection of unique RNA targets can have significant pathological relevance. For example, understanding cell-specific expression of splice variants and point mutations can reveal functional information about subcellular types. In addition, in oncology, splice variants and point mutations can dramatically alter the function of the target gene and, in turn, um, contribute to cancer progression. Similarly, highly homologous sequences are extremely difficult to detect due to their homology, but their functions are significant to assess gene expression and tumor progression and neurological development. Specific and sensitive detection of unique RNA targets, such as splice variants, commutation, and short or highly homologous um, transcripts can be very challenging. These require probes that are designed against very specific and short sequences on the target of interest. Attempts at detecting these short, short RNAs have relied heavily on traditional methods such as qPCR or RNA sequencing. Although these methods can deliver bulk expression levels, they do not provide detailed spatial information and gene expression at subcellular level. And that's where the base scope assay comes in. Um, using the base scope assay, you can achieve highly specific and highly sensitive detection of target genes while retaining the spatial and morphological information. To adjust customers' needs, ACD has developed the base scope assay to enable the detection of short RNA sequences with spatial and morphological information at single cell resolution. This assay specifically supports the detection of short RNA sequences, including splice variants, short and highly homologous sequences, and palm mutations, supporting popular applications such as cancer, neuroscience, 
hands-down gene therapy. The Baker platform uses probes that are designed in one to three ZZ probe lanes. The bottom of the Z's is designed to bind to the target-specific regions, while the top of the Z's is designed to bind to the basecode specific amplification tree. The basecode assay leverages ACD's core amplification and probe design capabilities to enable detection of the RNA molecules at single cell resolution, while improving the detection of short target RNAs with ease of data analysis. To enable further insights into your research, the Basecope assay is also compatible with HIC, detecting small RNA um, and protein simultaneously on the same tissue fly. The Basecope assay is developed with advances in probe design, leveraging core concepts of the double Z pattern technology and applies a novel amplification system that generates increased signal with simultaneous background noise suppression. ACD has over 26,000 um, unique probe designs, including both RNA scope and base scope in its catalog for customers to choose from. For custom probes, customer can submit the accession number or specific region of their target of interest. Then, the base scope probe is designed to target any customer's gene of interest using ACD's proprietary probe design algorithm. The optimal, optimal sequence is identified with consideration to unique regions DC regions and more to provide optimal specificity and to ensure no cross detection using the base scope assay. The unique base scope um, probe binding region covers a range of 50 to 300 nucleotides, which is outside of RNA scope probe design range. Standard base scope probe configuration is one to three ZZ oligo pairs that can be designed to detect splice variants, unique exon junction, short and highly homologous sequences and point mutations. Next, you'll learn about the specific base scope workflow. The base scope assay workflow is very similar to the RNA scope workflow um, for those of you who are familiar with our technology already. First, the cells or tissue that are bound to the slide is permeabilized using ACDs ready to use pretreatment reagents. Then, Target probes are hybridized to the target RNA. Currently, base scope allows for up to two RNA target detections in a single tissue section. After probe hybridization, the target probes will be hybridized with ACD's modified branch signal amplification tree, consisting of amplifiers and label probes by high sensitivity. After the colors have been developed, a single RNA molecule signal can be seen as red or green chromogen deposits using a bright field microscope. The slides can then also be scanned for further qualitative or quantitative analysis. The base scope assay is currently available in both the manual and automated workflows to fit your needs. In the manual workflow, base scope can be utilized as a single plex red assay to detect one target at a time on a tissue section or the duplex green and red assay to detect two targets on a single tissue section. In an automated workflow, base scope supports single plex red assay on either the Leica Bond RX or Ventana's Discovery Ultra. Base scope is a chromogenic assay, however, the fast red can also be viewed under a fluorescent microscope. And with that, I'll turn it over to Anishka to go into details of the base scope application. Thank you, Heli. Can you all hear me okay? Yes. Great. So after that brilliant introduction about the base scope assay, uh, I'll now be talking to you about specific applications of this technology uh, in your research. Next. So as you can see on your screen, the base scope assay can be applied for a wide range of research including detection of splice variants, detection of highly variable regions like CDR3s on your T cell receptors, for highly homologous sequences that are very similar uh, in sequence, but only have a short range of nucleotides to work with for probe design. 
Additionally, this assay can be used for detection of point mutations, really uh, small RNA moieties, and for detection of RNA and protein simultaneously on the same tissue. Additionally, our technology has been widely used as a validation tool for high throughput uh, RNA sequencing technologies uh, to get that spatial and morphological context. And because of these applications, we have been used widely in different research areas. Next, in basic science research, we have been applied for uh, research in neuroscience and developmental biology, especially for detection of circular RNAs. Next, we have been applied in infectious disease research for visualization of the viral transcriptome and to study the immune response induced by these infections. Next. We have been used in biopharma therapeutics for visualization of the vectors carrying the chimeric antigen or for detection of the chimeric protein itself for the different engineered immune cell therapies that are coming up in the market. And finally, our major application area is cancer and clinical research where uh, there are point mutations, splice variants, and microRNAs that play a significant role in initiation and progression of a number of malignancies. And using the PayScope technology, we can identify all these different uh, RNA or types of RNA in the cancer tissues and determine their role in a specific malignancy. Next. So with that, I want to talk to you about the target specific applications of the base scope assay. They can be divided into three major categories. Exon junction detection, which include uh, us designing a specific probe against the exon junction of your interest, which will allow you detection of targets like splice variants, uh, similar isoforms, circular RNAs, gene fusions, and so on. Additionally, we also allow detection of short sequences, where we design a probe that can be used for sequences between 50 to 300 nucleotides in length, for detection of highly homologous sequences like CDR3s on TCRs, for precursor microRNAs, uh, small nuclear RNAs, and gene editing. And finally, our third application area is detection of point mutations using the base scope assay where we have an extensive list of in-house validated point mutation probes that can be used to identify a specific point mutation in your tissue sample. Next. So to start off, we'll talk about the applications of base scope assay in detection of exon junction and splice variants. Next. So what are splice variants? Splice variants are uh, different isoforms of the same target genes that are formed because of alternate splicing event. If you can see on your screen, the diagram shows you how a single transcript of RNA can form three different uh, protein products based on the alternate splicing, uh, splicing strategy. So this tells you that the protein A, B, and C are coming from the same gene, uh, but are still quite different in their structure. So even if these three are the products of the same gene, they can vary significantly in their structure and also sometimes in their function. In this particular situation, because of the different structures of these three proteins, uh, although they might have different structure and functionality, sometimes these structures are not different enough to be distinguished using an antibody. So in that particular uh, event, using a specific base scope probe, you can differentiate between the three different transcripts of the same gene. Next. Now here is an example of how we use the base scope probe design strategy to identify the MET Delta 14 splice variant of the MET gene. Now, as you can see on the panel on the right hand side, a defines a normal splicing event where you have your pre-mRNA where the introns get spliced out and you get your mRNA transcript. But in the case of an aberrant splicing event in image B, 
you can see that the pre-mRNA, while splicing the introns, also can accidentally splice an exon, leading to formation of an alternate splice variant of the transcript. Now, this is exactly what happens in the MET Delta 14 transcript. As you can see, the MET wild type transcript has exon 12, 13, 14, and 15. But when the aberrant splicing event occurs, you get the exon, the exon 14 is now missing in this alternate splice variant. As a result, this particular MET protein now has a completely different function uh, than the wild type MET protein. And this is known to promote uh, growth and survival in a number of malignancies. So it's important to identify this variant of uh, MET transcript. So using a probe design strategy, we were able to design a probe against the exon junction 13 and 15, which would specifically identify the MET Delta 14 transcript. Then we were able to design a probe again, the exon junction 14 and 15, which would only pick up the wild type transcript. And the probe spanned across exon 12 and 13 can identify both the wild type and the MET Delta 14 transcript. So using this probe design strategy, we were able to identify this splice variant and distinguish it between the wild type and the Delta 14 splice variant. Next. So we use this probe design strategy to identify the splice variant between a cell line H596, which has the MET Delta 14 variant, and MET wild type cell line A549. As you can see, the wild type specific probe can only be seen in the MET wild type transcript in panel three, whereas the mutant specific probe can only detect signal in the MET Delta 14 positive cell line in the middle panel. Whereas the common probe that was designed against the 1213 junction shows a positive signal in both the top and the bottom cell line. Indic just showing you the specificity of our probe design strategy, wherein it will only allow detection of the mutant transcript in the mutant positive cell line, of the wild type transcript in the wild type positive cell line, and the probe that was common for both of these regions uh, showed detection of bo in both the wild type and the MET Delta 14 positive cell line. Highlighting how specific we can be with respect to our probe design strategy. Next. So using a similar probe design strategy, we also wanted to show you another example of how we detected the EGFR variant 3 in some of the glioblastoma tumors. So we used the same strategy wherein we designed probe against the exon junctions uh, to detect wild type transcript, the mutant transcript, and then a probe that would detect both the wild type and mutant transcript. Next. So in this slide, the top row represents a glioblastoma tumor that did not have the EGFR variant 3 and had the wild type EGFR. And the bottom row uh, is a sample that was known to have the EGFR variant 3. Now, using these uh, four different probes, we were able to show that the wild type probe was able to pick up signal in both the EGFR variant 3 negative and positive uh, glioblastoma tumor, indicating that majority, majority of the signal uh, is seen in the negative cell line, but there are some cells in the GFR variant 3 positive tumor where you see positive signal for the wild type EGFR, indicating there are some cells that has the wild type transcript. On the other hand, when you look at the fourth panel, which is specific for the mutant probe, you can only detect signal in the EGFR variant 3 positive tumor, and there is no signal detected in the EGFR 3 negative tumor. Again, indicating that we can specifically design the probe against this mutant splice variant and identify patient samples that have uh, this variant 3, uh, which would in turn help us design uh, the most effective therapeutic strategy for that patient. Next.
Now, here is an example of how uh, researchers have used our base scope assay in identifying splice variants in the clinic. So, in this particular example, they wanted to identify the Delta 16 HER2 splice variant in uh, breast cancer and some other malignancies. So, HER2 is an important signaling receptor, uh, predominantly involved in promoting cell growth and survival. Overexpression of this protein in cancer enables them to grow at a significantly higher rate. So treatments focused on targeting HER2 in breast cancer uh, include Herceptin, a monoclonal antibody directed against the HER2 receptor. And this has demonstrated considerable success. The Delta-16 HER2 mutation leads to a constitutively active HER2 receptor, uh, and this leads to activation of downstream signaling pathway, even in the absence of a ligand. So increased expression of Delta-16 HER2 can make the tumor cells overly dependent on this HER2 pathway, uh, in turn rendering them more sensitive to the HER2-specific Herceptin therapy. So these researchers wanted to identify the patients that had this Delta-16 HER2 splice variants and stratify them for Herceptin therapy. So again, using the same probe design strategy, they were able to design probes specific for the Delta-16 HER2 variant, a probe specific for the wild type HER2, and a probe that would detect both the Delta-16 variant and the wild type. Next. So here they are studying uh, three samples uh, that show positive detection of the Delta-16 HER2 splice variant in the rightmost panel, uh, but it also shows positive signal for the wild type HER2 receptor seen in the middle two panels. Uh, this indicating that these samples have both the Delta-16 variant and the wild type. Uh, but what is interesting is that where base scope can distinguish between these splice variants, using an antibody against HER2, uh, you are not able to distinguish between these different splice variants of the HER2 receptor. Thereby, it would be difficult to stratify patients just by doing an IHC for HER2. Next. So now we're going to talk about uh, another form of splice variants called circular RNAs, which are caused, which are generated because of head to tail splicing and how base scope can be used for detection of these circular RNAs. Next. So in this particular example, we are going to see how we used base scope probes to detect uh, DL gap one circular RNAs. So as you can see in the um, cartoon, in a regular splicing event, you would have your linear RNA formed, but when you have head to tail splicing, you get a circular RNA. And these circular RNAs can have important regulatory functions uh, for gene expression. Uh, especially in the developing brain. So here we wanted to specifically identify the circular form of DL gap one in the developing mouse brain. So we used a probe design strategy where we designed a probe against the head to tail splicing junction, exon seven and exon nine, that would only detect the circular RNAs. Then we designed a probe that you see in purple Exon, uh, spanning exon 9 and exon 10 that would identify the linear form of uh, DL gap RNA. And then again, a third probe that would span, that would detect both circular and linear forms. Next. So as you can see, uh, we detected all the two, the, the two different forms of DL gap RNA, circular and linear, in the hippocampal region of this mouse brain. But as you can see, uh, the majority of uh, DL gap was present as the linear mRNA form uh, compared to very low expression of the circular mRNA in this particular stage of uh, the mouse mm, brain, developing brain. Next. Here is another example of how researchers have used space scope as a for visualization of circular RNAs. In this example, they wanted to study the role of uh, circular SMAD4 RNA in myogenesis. So they decided to use our base scope duplex assay to visualize 
uh, the linear and circular form of SMAT4 RNA in the same section. And as you can see, uh, you can get that subcellular localization of both these transcripts in this particular muscle tissue, uh, indicating that using this duplex assay, you can really leverage the capability of visualizing two targets simultaneously and study the difference and the differential expression between the linear and circular forms of the same target of your interest. Next. So in addition to visualizing RNA alone, as I mentioned earlier, because of the natural complementarity of the ISH and ILC technologies, we have devised a workflow where you can visualize your RNA using a uh, base code and then perform IF or IFC uh, to visualize your protein of interest, such that you get your target RNA and protein detected on the same section. Next. Here is an example of where we detected the, cir the circular DL GAP1 RNA in combination with the MAP2 protein. So MAP2 will specifically highlight the dendrites. And as you can see in the zoomed in image, we can clearly see the punctate red dots of the circular DL GAP1 RNA co-localizing with the MAP2 positive dendrites, thus giving you more information about the subcellular localization of your target gene expression. Next slide. As Heli mentioned earlier, our red assays are capable of being visualized under a fluorescent microscope. This is because uh, the fast red dye that we use in this assay is capable of fluorescing under the fluorescent microscope. So for a better contrast, if you want to visualize your assay under fluorescent microscope, you can stain your slide with DAPI and use a fluorescently labeled antibody and uh, like, like in this example, and visualize your signal under a fluorescent microscope. You can see the red punctate dots, which are the signal for your DL GAP1 circular RNA against the background of your MAP2 positive dendrites. So you can get better contrast for really low expressing targets by leveraging this um, capability of our red chromogen to fluoresce under a fluorescent microscope. Next. So now we're gonna talk about the second application which is detection of short sequences. Next. Next. So here's an example of how um, the base scope assay was used to distinguish between the edited and non-edited uh, transcript of the same gene. So using the CRISPR technology, we deleted up to 50 base pairs of sequence from a wild type transcript to create a, an edited version of the same transcript. And the customer wanted to visualize both the wild type and the edited transcript simultaneously to see the efficacy of the gene editing and also understand uh, the effect of the gene editing on the function of um, the host cells. So here we have done gene editing on a liver tissue, and we're now gonna visualize both the edited and wild type transcript simultaneously. Next slide. So as you can see here, we designed probes specifically against the wild type transcript and probes specific for the edited transcript. And using the duplex assay, visualize both these transcripts in the edited liver and the control liver, which was not edited using the CRISPR technology. So on your left-hand side is a panel of your non-edited tissue, where you can see that we only see signal for the wild type transcript indicated in green. And there is no signal detected for the edited transcript as you would expect. On the other hand, in your right-hand side panel, you can see detection of both the edited and the uh, wild type transcript. Uh, but majority of the signal is for your edited transcript showing that uh, there was success in the CRISPR editing uh, for the most part, but there are some cells that still have one allele uh, potentially of the wild type transcript. So this also allows you to see the uh, monoallelic expression of your wild type or edited transcript and then study the effect of this uh, 
expression of your wild type and edited transcript in the same cell and study the function of these uh, hepatocytes. So this is another very important application um, which can be used in cell and gene therapy studies to when you're developing new therapeutics uh, based on gene editing. Next. A very popular application of using our Bayscope technology is that of detection of CDR3 regions on T cell receptors. Now, uh, in the last few years, engineered T cell therapies have uh, really started to uh, become important therapeutic strategies, especially for cancer. And to identify clonal populations of T cells, it's important to study or detect the CDR3 regions of the specific TCRs. So using the base scope assay, we can design a probe specifically against these CDR3 regions and identify specific clonal T cells. Next. Here's an example where using the base scope assay, we design a probe specifically against the alpha and beta CDR3 of JERCAT cells, and then alpha and beta CDR3 of CCRF cells. And using the CCRF and JERCAT pellets, you can see that we can only detect positive signal when we use JERCAT probes in JERCAT pellet, whereas we only detect positive signal when we use CCRF specific probes in the CCRF pellet. Just highlighting the specificity of these CDR3 probes that we can design uh, for, diff uh, for specific uh, T cell populations. And this is an important application like I said, in uh, studying clonal population of T cells and understanding the efficacy of uh, newly developed immunotherapies. Next. And here is a great example to highlight that application. When this paper published in Nature Medicine last year uh, utilized the base scope assay to identify an immune cell population that induced encephalitis in this patient that was being treated with anti-PD-1 therapy. So this patient uh, developed adverse events due to anti-PD-1 therapy treatment and developed encephalitis. And using the TCR sequencing technology, they were able to identify a sequence that was predominantly expressed in this encephalitis tissue. Once they had the sequence, they designed a base scope probe against the sequence and visualized uh, this target in situ. They identified that this particular TCR was co-localizing with CD4 positive T cells, uh, suggesting, and not with CD8 positive T cells, suggesting this was a specific population of T cells that was inducing the encephalitis. So upon further analysis, they were indeed able to confirm that it is a memory CD4 positive T cell population inducing this encephalitis. So the base scope assay here played a significant role in allowing validation and visualization of the specific T cell population inducing encephalitis in this patient. Next. As I mentioned, a very important application of the uh, RNA scope technology, including the RNA scope and base scope assays, is validation of single cell sequencing data. Now, single cell analysis has uh, gained a lot of importance in the last few years, uh, especially because it provides you specific information uh, at the single cell resolution, helps you identify different subpopulation of cells in complex tissues and study specific gene expression within those populations. This ultimately uh, enhances your understanding of the function of each of these cell populations. But what you lose in this particular technique is the spatial and morphological context. So a lot of our customers like to use the base scope or RNA scope assays to validate their uh, gene expression data obtained from single cell sequencing analysis. Next. So in this particular example uh, that was uh, published in Nature last year, they were studying the uh, multiple sclerosis brain and trying to under identify the different immune cell populations within this deceased brain. And using the single nuclear RNA sequencing analysis, they were able to identify different subpopulations of uh, immune cells. And using specific probes against markers for individual subpopulations, they validated the single nuclear 
RNA-seq data uh, by base scope. As you can see in the bottom panel, they use the duplex assay and they picked a marker specific for oligodendrocyte 5 and oligodendrocyte 1 and visualized uh, their expression uh, in situ. As you can see, the red and the green signal do not co-localize, indicating that these are indeed independent population of oligodendrocytes and confirm the data obtained from single nuclear uh, sequencing. Next. They further went on to show that they had identified a population of cells called oligodendroglia, which are a hybrid cell population between oligodendrocytes and microglia and show characteristics of both these cell types. And they had identified this by single nuclear sequencing, but they wanted to actually visualize the presence of these cells in situ. So they used a marker specific for oligodendrocytes and a marker specific for microglia uh, to see if, if these hybrid cells uh, indeed exist. So after co-localization, as you can see in the image, they saw that these two markers indeed co-localized, uh, indicating that the uh, MS lesions had higher levels of these hybrid cell populations, uh, confirming the single nuclear uh, sequencing data. And these hybrid cell populations might have something to do with uh, increased progression uh, seen in some of these uh, MS patients thus providing some more clues about this disease and potentially helping understand the be understand better therapeutic strategies to treat advancing uh, MS patients. Next. Now I want to give you an example of a very interesting application of the base scope technology, which is detection of uh, premature microRNAs. Now, microRNAs are important regulatory RNAs, especially in oncology, where they are known to change the gene signature of tumors to uh, either promote growth or help suppress growth of these tumors. In this particular example, they are studying the expression of microRNA 135P and understanding its role in malignant transformation of uh, gastric cancer. So what they established was chronic inflammation in the gastric tissue can promote malignant transformation of the gastric cells. And expression of MIR-135P was a, uh, was a clue uh, as to how this gastritis can uh, cause malignant transformation into gastric cancer. So if you can see in the panel, uh, wild type tissue of uh, a, normal, uh, a normal gastric tissue uh, showed really low expression of MIR-135P, whereas when you look at the expression in a gastritis, which is uh, inflammation of the gastric tissue or a gastric cancer tissue, you see a really high expression, high to moderate expression of MIR-135P. So this tells you that the gene signature of this particular microRNA starts changing uh, uh, in, under conditions of chronic inflammation and uh, maintain itself uh, through malignant transformation in gastric cancer, suggesting that uh, this regulatory RNA might have a significant role to play in this malignant transformation of gastritis to gastric cancer. So uh, our base assay currently can detect the premature form of microRNAs, but uh, we are coming up with an assay in the summer that will specifically help you identify uh, different microRNAs and other short sequences like uh, siRNAs and ASOs, uh, which will increase the efficacy of detection of these microRNAs. And uh, we'll be uh, presenting more data on this in the coming months, but uh, do stay tuned on more information about the new assay launch. Next. So let's talk about our last application for today, which is detection of point mutations. And as you know, this is a major driving force behind some of the solid tumor malignancies, but detection of these point mutations can oftentimes be extremely challenging. Next. So in ACD, we have a panel of 15 is uh, validated point mutation probes 
for the base scope assay, where we have designed these probes and validated them internally. And this list uh, includes uh, some of the most popular point mutations, which are your driver mutations for most of your solid uh, tumor malignancies. And these probes have been validated both on manual and automated platforms. So if you need more information about how you can procure one of these probes, do reach out to us and we'll be happy to provide you more information. Next. So here's an example of how we've used our base scope BRAF V600E point mutation probe to detect this point mutation in cell lines. So uh, in the SKML28 cell line, which is positive for the BRAF V600E mutation, we can see positive signal, uh, very punctate dots um, within the cell. But when you use this probe on a wild type cell line, you do not see any signal. Again, highlighting the specificity of our pointed uh, point mutation probe design. Next. Using similar probe design strategy, uh, this is an example of detection of KRAS G126 point mutation, which is predominantly seen in lung tumors and colorectal cancer. Uh, and again, we use a cell line that was positive for this point mutation and a cell line that was negative for this point mutation. And you can only see signal in the KRAS G12C positive cell line, highlighting a uh, specificity of detection. Next. Now, here is a, a published example of how Dr. Baker's group used the base scope assay to visualize different point mutations uh, in the colorectal cancer tissues. And um, as you can see, using our specific probes, they were able to uh, pinpoint specific tumor samples that had these point mutations. And if you concentrate on the right-hand side panel, there you can see using the KRAS G12A probe, they were able to identify a subpopulation, a clonal population of tumor cells uh, that were positive for this point mutation. And if you can see, it's a very small population of cells in this large tumor. But using our base scope assay, we were able to detect even these handful of cells um, that were showing this point mutations. Again, highlighting the sensitivity of our assay, which allows you to identify the clonal population of your uh, tumor cells that might be exhibiting these point mutations. Um, so next slide. With that, I want to just um, give you a final example of how this assay can be used in the clinic, again, to stratify patients for therapy. Uh, in this particular, with this particular research group, they use the base scope assay to specifically uh, identify point mutations of EGFR. Now, EGFR mutations, as you know, is an important driver mutation in lung cancer and can promote tumor growth and survival. So they know they identify that uh, patients with the EGFR L858R mutation uh, showed uh, considerable success with tyrosine kinase inhibitor therapy. Whereas patients with EGFR7 or uh, T790M mutation uh, were resistant to the TKI therapies. So they wanted to use our base scope strategy to differentiate between patients that had positive uh, EGFR L858R mutations and stratified them for TKI therapies. So the design, they used our base scope probes specific for these mutations. And as you can see in the panel, they were able to pick up mutations in these patient samples using our base scope probes. And they also compared the efficacy of our base scope detection to that of PCR and showed that the detection efficacy is uh, pretty comparable between these two technologies. They also went on to uh, add that using the base scope assay, they were able to get that spatial and histological context that was lost uh, with the PCR um, assay. So not only were they able to get the specific detection, but now they were getting it with the morphological context. And using this assay, they were able to stratify patients in the clinic uh, for TKI therapy. Next. So with that, I want to hand the platform back to Hedy, and we will be able to answer any questions you have uh, towards the end of the presentation. Thank you, Anushka. Um, thank you so much for the very detailed application examples. 
um, showing how the Basecamp assay could support these applications. So next, how do we know that the Basecamp assay works? Uh, we'll provide some example um, and information of our customer experience. So many Basecamp customers have used the Basecamp assay and loved it because it's the only technology out there that can detect the application as single cell resolution while still providing spatial and morphological information. Highlighting here is one of our customers um, from the Chung Lab at SVP who had tremendous experience using our Basecamp assay. The feedback for the Basecamp is that the Basecamp procedure is straightforward and robust, providing them with meaningful data to support novel genomic observations that other methods cannot do. And also with successful assays and meaningful data, here comes publications. This customer from the Chung Lab has also published their basic of data in Nature, where it's located on the right side of the slide where you can um, look into more details. Publications are significant pieces of scientific materials that researchers really leverage for understanding current trends. So ACD has close to um, 2,700 publications as of to date, and over 200 publications just this year so far. Within the thousands of publications, Basecamp has over 85 publications in just four years, with the most popular applications in splice variants, followed by short sequences and point mutations. Also, a fun fact to know is that an average of 25% of our publications are published in Nature, Cell, and Science the top three scientific journals out there. So use the Basecamp assay to help you publish. So with that, to summarize today's topic, Basecamp assay is a robust RNA in situ hybridization assay enabling the detection of short RNAs in tissues with spatial and morphological context of single cell resolution. Some of the key applications include slice variants, highly homologous sequences, form mutations, and other short RNA sequences that are 50 to 300 nucleotides. The base of single plex assay is available on the, both the manual or the fully automated platforms, whereas the base of duplex assay is available on the manual platform currently. We would also like to let you know that we'll be presenting a poster presentation at AACR this year on specifically the application of KRAS mutation in non small cell lung cancer tumors. It will be presented by Anishka during the um, trade show. Um, so we understand the challenges that many of us are facing during the pandemic. However, uh, research must go on, and that is why um, our services teams are here to assist you with moving your research forward. Our pharma assay services are fully operational and could help you advance your research in the de detection of splice variants, short targets, and permutations. If you'd like to send in your samples and for the assay to be validated by ACD. Our service team ensures that all due care is taken care of with your samples and that the assay development and analysis is conducted with highest efficiency. Our pharma assay services has recently received awards from the Pharma Tech Outlook for being one of the top 10 CROs of both 2019 and 2020 consecutively. In addition to pharma assay services, we also offer academic assay services for those of you who are working in the institution. The benefits of having ACD validate your target of interest in your samples include saving resources with your pilot study before setting up for a larger scale in your own lab, and also receiving your results in a quick turnaround for your grant application and or paper submission. Please contact our technical support team for more information on our academic assay services. With that, I would like to thank everyone for attending today's webinar. Next, I'll post some of the most frequently asked questions um, on the base of assay for you to review. While you're reviewing these questions, we'll scan through some live chat questions from the chat box and provide some responses to them here to the broader audience. For those of you exiting the webinar, we thank you for joining the webinar today, and I hope you learn more about our Basecamp product line. If you have any questions, please find the contact information for technical support on this slide. So here are some commonly, um, some commonly asked questions on the Basecamp assay. While you review these, uh, we'll go ahead and scan through some uh, live questions and address them.
here are a couple of questions that um, we could address to the broader audience. One of the questions asking, um, what are the sample types that Basecope enables to detect? So the Basecope assay, um, it supports a wide variety of different sample types, including um, FFP, formalin fixed paraffin embedded tissues, um, also fresh frozen tissues, and fresh um, and fixed frozen tissues, and also culture cells as well. Another good question is that how long does it take for um, to synthesize the base code probes? So for the base code probes, from the date of order to the date of shipping, it will require three weeks. So including um, probe design as well as um, shipping it out to you. That's about a three-week turnaround time. So all the other questions that uh, we might not have gotten responses to, um, please note that we'll uh, respond to your questions via email after the webinar. And then also the webinar is um, has been recorded, so the recording will be posted on our website. So with that, thank you so much for joining our webinar. We hope you enjoyed it.